Grace and mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and in love. In that, our goal here at the Apostolic Church of Raleigh is to be absolutely spirit-led in everything that we do. There are no rituals, there are no traditions, there are no orders of service. We simply come to pray and seek the face of God. And then our ears are open to hear what the Spirit is speaking to the church. For the past uh, few few days, probably since the beginning of this week, the Spirit has been dealing with me strongly concerning a specific topic. And then that is confirmed this morning through the word of prophecy that came through Sister Annie talking about the, the hearts of many waxing cold. It'd be fine for our children to be dismissed at this time too. The hearts of many waxing cold. From way back in the Old Testament, as the Spirit of the Almighty God moved upon the prophets, they prophesied concerning the very tactics that the enemy would use against the people of God. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, um, Elder Franco taught so wonderfully, and it has blessed me tremendously, concerning Daniel chapter 7, and how that the ploy of the enemy is to wear out the saints. Amen? He's doing that on a number of different levels. Spiritually is, is his ultimate goal. He wants to wear out the saints spiritually to the place where we are not sensitive to what's going on in the spiritual realm. You, you do realize that everything that goes on in the physical realm, that's, that's not the root of the issue. We look at wars, we look at, at, at uh, racism, we look at hunger, we look at oppression, we look at political governments, uh, all of these things. We look at earthquakes, famines, pestilences, as the Bible refers to them. And those are physical things that we can see and we can hear and we can experience. But none of those things are the root issue. It's much like a puppet who you see the puppets out from behind the curtain. But back somewhere behind the curtain is the puppet master. And he's the one pulling the strings. So what we see going on in the physical I talked to somebody this week we were, I can't even remember who it was now but we were discussing a particular topic and we're talking about people are trying to fix spiritual problems with physical solutions You cannot fix a spiritual problem with a carnal-minded physical solution. It's like putting a Band-Aid on cancer. It's not going away because you cover it up. You can't just slap some superficial solution on these spiritual, spiritually rooted problems that we're having. Do you follow me? Wars, rumors of wars, all of these things are rooted in the spiritual realm. And many people, even Christians today who should be spiritually minded people are oblivious to the spiritual realm. I see Christians Facebook. I get all, uh, you just need to be on Facebook for a couple of minutes and you can discern. It's amazing. I see Christians bickering back and forth all the time about politics. 
Some, some Christians are Democrats, some Christians are Republicans, and they're bickering back and forth about who's going to fix this country. And I'm thinking to myself, you are trying to fix a spiritual problem with a carnal-minded solution. David said, the nation that forgets God shall be turned into hell. It doesn't matter if the Republicans are in control or if Democrats are in control. It's still going to be turned into hell until that people return to their God and repent. No human being can fix that problem. It's a spiritual problem. And we get all up in arms, all divided from one another, trying to apply carnal-minded solutions to a spiritual problem. Paul talked about one that beateth against the air. Fighting something that... I'm going to swing on a demon. What good is that going to do? Throw nubs with a fallen angel. Try to beat him up physically. If I'm going to defeat a spiritual problem, I'm going to have to defeat it with a spiritual solution, a spiritual warfare. Correct? Knowing these things then, we must get back to the root of the issue. And the prophets have prophesied exposing the wiles of the enemy for thousands of years. Daniel said that Satan's ploy in the last days, which I believe we are living in, he said that Satan's ploy would be to wear out the saints. Spiritually, But he starts physically. He wants to wear you out physically. He wants to make us sick and afflicted. He wants us worried about money and finances and jobs to the place where we are so consumed with physical things that we are completely oblivious to what he's doing behind the scenes. He wants to wear us out. If you'll remember, uh, also a couple of weeks ago, we taught on Babylon the Great, Revelation chapter 17 and verse 18. And and give me 17. I want to run through and get to that one particular verse because I feel very strongly impressed to remind us of this this morning before I go into something different. Revelation 17 and, and 1. I want to start at 1 to give context. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke to me saying, come here, I will show the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. This is... John being spoken to, John the Revelator, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth, so there's a harlot that the kings, the political rulers of the earth, have committed acts of immorality. Those who dwell on the earth were made drunk. They're made drunk with the wine of her. So this harlot, to make a long story short, is false religion. That's why in verse 5 he refers to her as Babylon, names her as Babylon the Great. False religion started at the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, where they said, come, let us build a tower where we will ascend into the heavens. And their whole goal was to be like God, to be on the same level as God. And it was there that false religion was born, Babel, the Tower of Babel. Anybody know what Babel eventually became? Babylon, same city. So that's why John, thousands of years later, refers to this harlot as Babylon the Great. He's letting us know that this traces, this spirit of false religion traces itself all the way back to the Tower of Babel, Nimrod, the false religion that Nimrod set up. Now, he said that Babylon the Great is the mother of harlots. Which means she's a harlot, but she gave birth to other harlots. So the spirit of false religion that was birthed in Babylon eventually manifested itself in many ways. It started out as paganism. But then it didn't stop at at pagan beliefs and heathen beliefs. 
you get into the Old Testament, the, the Israelites were constantly being lulled by false gods. Molech. They're constantly being rebuked for following after Molech. Many false gods. Baal. And that's, that's constantly the people of God are being pulled away from the one true God, Yahweh, to these false gods. And that spirit of false religion has constantly and ever been pursuing after the people of God. To pull them into a drunken state of what the King James refers to as fornication and adultery. Spiritual fornication, which is natural fornication, sex outside of marriage. Spiritual fornication is any sort of spiritual relationship with a God other than the one whom you've been given to. The one true God, Yahweh. So when Israel followed after these other gods, they were committing spiritual fornication against the one true God of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Ephesians 3, or Exodus 3.15. The great I am. Spiritual fornication. Now John tells us, so in, in the Old Testament, it was false gods, completely different religions, completely different gods. Now, when Christ came and the new covenant was instituted and now the Gentiles are being brought in with the Jewish believers and one new body has been made, things changed. The enemy understood that spirit of false religion, this harlot that John is speaking about, that spirit of false religion understood, I'm not going to beat the Christians by trying to get them to worship Baal anymore. So now what I'm going to do is give birth to other harlots. And instead of trying to beat Christianity, I'm going to join it. Water it down. I'll take pure Christianity and mix it with these old pagan heathen practices. Like praying to the dead. Catholicism is based on praying to Mary and other dead saints. But when Yahweh spoke in the Old Testament, he said, if any man is a necromancer, which means communication with the dead, Yahweh said, let them be stoned. But yet the largest Christ Christian denomination in the world today is based on necromancy. So now we see that this spirit of false religion isn't just trying to get us to chase false gods. It's trying to get us to believe in God, yet be deceived at the same time. What's the more dangerous lie? The one that is a blatant, bald-faced lie. And you know it from the get-go, that's a lie. Or... The lie that has been mixed with just enough truth to make you confused enough to be duped into believing the lie. Isn't that what Paul said? He said in the last days, he said, if people don't love the truth, they will be deceived. God shall send them a strong delusion. God will allow this to happen. Which means I better love truth more than I love any tradition of men that I have been taught. Because we're not just dealing with Babylon, the mother of harlots anymore. We're now dealing with her daughter which have mixed themselves, fornicated and committed adultery. And now fake truth has been mixed with lies. Do you see the tactics of the enemy? Now, what has happened in our generation? Because now you start talking about doctrinal issues. Doc, who preaches?
preaches on doctrine anymore. What church do you go to? What mega church do you go to anywhere that says anything about doctrine anymore? They don't teach about who God is, who Christ is, the true salvation message, holiness, righteousness, divorce and remarriage, church structure, gifts of the Spirit. They don't mention any of these things anymore. Why? Because when a carnal-minded person delves into the realm of trying to separate the bowl of spaghetti that is truth mixed with lies... When they start trying to figure it out with the carnal mind, they become weary. It's too much. It's just too much to try to search this out and figure out who's right and who's wrong. So what I'll do is just quit my search for truth and keep believing what I believe, and you just believe what you believe, and it'll all work out in the end. What has happened to such a person? They have been put to sleep. The enemy has worn them out to the place to where they're too tired mentally and spiritually to seek for truth and nothing but truth. They're weary with the search. They're weary with the study. And they become asleep in Zion. At ease. Watch this. Watch how John says that this harlot would operate. Kings of the earth, false religion, which means politics gets involved in false religion. And the two work together. We're trying to fix a political problem, and we don't understand that the root of it is spiritual. Whom the kings of the earth committed acts of immorality, and those who dwell on the earth were made drunk with the wine of her. So what is, what is the goal of the harlot? To get the people of the earth so drunk that they don't even realize what's going on. Now what happens, don't nobody go back to your old days. We, we don't want to live in the past. Some of y'all were probably drunk sitting in this church right now. You're probably drunks. And you know what happens when you drink and drink and drink and drink and drink. The, the first thing that happens is you start losing sensitivity. You start losing motor skills. You don't, you don't really know what's going on around you. You're kind of in your own little world over here. And then reality is playing itself out around you like the old country song says, went to bed with a 10 and woke up with a 1. The only thing that changed was your perception. He was just as ugly when you went to bed with him as he was when you woke up with him. The only difference was your perception. You got so drunk that you literally could not see the truth anymore. It's right in front of your face. You're kissing it. Loving on it. That's exactly what's going on spiritually. That's the picture that John's painting for us. He wants the whole, she wants the whole world to be so drunk that they don't know what's truth and what's the lie. And what happens if you keep on drinking? Eventually you're going to pass out. Your body will shut down and you will go into a deep sleep where people hardly can't wake you up. Isn't that what the prophet said? That's the, the ploy of Satan is through false religion to make us so drunk with lies that we don't even care to seek out the truth anymore. We're happy in our drunken stupor. But when we wake up, it'll be too late. You follow this? And those who dwell on the earth 
were made drunk with the wine of her immorality and carried me away. And he carried me away in the spirit to a wilderness. John's being carried away in the spirit to a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. This woman is that great harlot, full of blasphemous names having seven heads and ten horns. He used a lot of parabolic, symbolic language throughout this parable. Having seven heads. The beast had seven heads and ten horns. And the, the woman was sitting on top of it. And as he explains, as you read on down throughout 17 and 18, the beast is the world system, the political structure. The, the, the seven heads and ten horns are kings. And this woman of false religion, the spirit of false religion is sitting on top of these kings ruling the world. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet. I'll get into all that. And adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having in her hand a gold cup full of... Here's her cup again. What's she drinking? What's she serving to others? abominations of the unclean things of her immorality. And on her forehead, a name was written. It's a mystery, John said. But then he gives us the name. Here's her name, Babylon. So we can trace her all the way back to Babel, Nimrod. That's where false religion started. There was no false religion until that point. At that point, you just had sin. Men were wicked. They killed one another. They raped. They stole. It wasn't until the Tower of Babel where false religion then started operating in the earth. And it spread from there. We call it Easter. In Babylon, it was called Ishtar. Ishtar was a goddess of sex and fertility. Guess what her symbols were? Rabbits and eggs. When, now when people partake of bunnies and eggs, they, are, they have been so drunk that they don't even realize what the source of such things are. And you try to tell them and they don't care. You, you do know b- bunnies and eggs is pagan worship. No, 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 no. I'm doing it for Christ. God says plainly, Deuteronomy 12, read the end of Deuteronomy 12, read Jeremiah 10, read Deuteronomy 18. All these verses say, God explicitly says, when I give you the lands of the Gentiles and you go into them, don't you dare start learning the way of the heathen. Don't you dare start worshiping me according to their customs. You don't worship me the same way they worship their gods. You worship me the way I have told you to worship me. And yet now people do the exact opposite. Trying to worship the one true God, but with pagan forms of worship. And he said plainly, do not do these abominations. But people have become so a false religion that they don't even care anymore. They're too weary to try to figure out the truth and the lies. I'll just do what I want to do and it'll all work out in the end. It'll work out in the end. Do not sleep. Do not let the world's, all the confusion that's going on in the religious world today, don't let that rock you to sleep. Don't let that make you weary in well-doing. Seek truth and pursue it at all costs. Don't become weary in well-doing. Don't become weary in seeking for the spirit of truth to lead you into all truth. Don't be drunk with the wine of her intoxication, her abominations and filthiness. She's trying to put us to sleep. She's trying to wear us out. Babylon the Great, the mother 
of harlots and of the abominations. <sighs> Give me six. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood. Anybody who stood up for truth, she killed them. Anybody who started declaring and exposing her false ways got persecuted. Do you realize the Pharisees were some of the most religious people on the face of the earth. What did they do to Christ? Killed him. Many times tried to kill him. They took up stones and sometimes he escaped them. But they eventually got him only because it was the perfect will of God. But they eventually got him. They put him on the cross. Why? Because he exposed every false way that they had been sipping on for hundreds of years. And so the spirit of false religion that was operating in them stopped at nothing short than shutting the mouth of every messenger of truth. That's why Jesus said, don't, don't be fearful when they persecute you. So persecuted they the prophets who went before you. Anybody speaking truth, they get drunk. She and whoever is under her influence gets drunk with the blood of the true saints of God and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. When I saw her, I wondered greatly. Give me seven. Just read the rest of that, 17 and 18. For yourselves. So you see this. You see the plan of the enemy then. Is to make us weary and well doing. To wear us out. To make us drunk, sleepy. Put us at slumber, at ease in Zion. What, what does it mean then? With this figurative language. What, what, what does this mean? It means... That the enemy is completely fine with us gathering together, going through rituals and traditions, going through the motions of having church. But everybody sitting on the pew spiritually is asleep. Nobody cares about the truth anymore. Nobody cares what's right, what's wrong. They have that mentality, that abomination, that fornication, that mentality well, we'll just all try to get along. This woman rules the world system. She, she has influence and control in the world system. I was thinking this week, God began to deal with me about Hollywood, for an example. What is the purpose of Hollywood? In this generation. It, it, most people, you ask them that question, they say, well, Hollywood is for our entertainment. Nothing wrong with that. It just entertains us. They don't have a clue. Now Hollywood, in, in the last two or three years, has reverted to making films about biblical stories. And then you watch these films, and ain't nothing in these films lines up with the scriptures. It's like they literally are rewriting the entire story. What, what is the, you cannot tell me, it, it is the ploy of Satan to try and twist. The, the homosexual agenda. You can't watch a TV show now without there being a gay couple in it. What, why is that? Because they want people to get so used to seeing homosexuality and how normal it is that society as a whole begins to accept it without even questioning it anymore. And so we watch TV shows and we see this play out. And every time we do, we become a little bit more desensitized, a little bit more drunk with her fornications Her whole goal 
is to rock us to sleep. Uh, give me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It ain't working. Froze up. Y'all going to have to go old school and get, get back with your Bibles. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes up here. First. first Thessalonians 5 and verse 1. Chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to start with verse number 1. If you have it, say amen. amen. That sounds like a majority. Watch this. Sounds similar to what Daniel said in, in Daniel chapter 7. The same ploy, be not ignorant of Satan's devices, but of the times and of the seasons, brethren. Ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. Speaking of them being the world system, the world structure. Peace and safety. Sudden destruction shall cometh upon them and travail got it on the screen and travail as travail upon a woman with child so he's saying their destruction is going to come like a pregnant woman gives birth to a child that travail that labor that pain is going to come upon them in that manner and they shall not escape the world's not going to escape from the judgment which is to come For, f- verse four but ye brethren are not in darkness that the day should overtake you. They are in such darkness, they have literally literally been lulled to sleep. They're in a drunken stupor that they have no clue what's going on. But he said the children of God will not be in such a state. The true children of God who have separated Truth from lies. Those will not be in darkness that the day should overtake them as a thief. That's a beautiful promise. What do you do when it gets dark? Because if I get in a dark place, I'm going to start nodding. Darkness. That that day should overtake you as a thief. Verse 5. Ye are all the children of what? And of the day. We'll give the little one time to calm out, chill out. So we're children of the day. We are not of the night. You don't operate in darkness. We should be awake, not children of the night, nor are we children of darkness. Therefore, the way he writes this is like, others will feel completely comfortable going to sleep. But I'm telling you, you, don't, you can't afford to sleep like everybody else does. You can't afford to lay down and take a rest. From searching the scriptures daily to see if these things be so. You can't become weary in well doing. You can't take a break from pursuing truth. 
You've got to give yourself to it night and day. We cannot sleep as others do. But let us. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears open. Be on watch concerning what's going on. The reason people get rocked to sleep, it's like hypnotism. When that guy waves that watch in front of them, they get so focused on that watch that they out like a light. I don't know if that stuff is true or not. Anyway, they get so distracted by something that means nothing that they lose focus on reality and, and go into a, a state of slumber. All the while, they're being told that their rest is a good thing. You're going to feel this calmness come over you. Just embrace the calmness. And then once they get you to sleep, that you're going to start clucking like a chicken. What, whatever manipulation they want to place upon you, that's exactly. And you're not even aware that you're acting like a fool. You're sharing your deepest, darkest secrets with a stranger. Isn't that what the modern church tells us? It, 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 oh. Modern religion, this false religion, is doing the same thing to the saints right now. They're telling the saints, take it easy. Don't get caught up in these doctrinal divisions. I heard a very popular preacher, if I called his name, everybody in here would know him, said, I, and it made me sick to my stomach when he made this statement. He said, God has liberated me from preaching on such divisive issues as doctrines of salvation. And I'm thinking, it was not God that liberated you from preaching the gospel. That's the only reason God called you. The spirit of false religion has liberated him. From preaching on divisive issues such as salvation. And he feels comfortable stating these things on national television. Why? Because the saints are just as drunk as he is. They, they listen to what he says and says, oh yeah, we don't have to argue about these things anymore. And they've been told that their rest and their slumber is a good thing. When the apostles told us to contend earnestly for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. You know what the word contend means? Fight. That's what a boxer is. He is a contender. And he will contend against stronger opponents until he can get to the heavyweight champion of the world. And he'll be the number one contender. And if he can beat the champion, he'll become the champion. They contend. And that's the language the apostles used. But yet, people aren't contending now. They don't want to fight. Well, you just let me believe what I want to believe and you believe what you're going to believe and, and it's all going to work out. It's going to work out. And all the while, the spirit of truth is moving upon our hearts and our minds, telling us in our conscience, study. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Study the scriptures. Pray. Pray that ye be not deceived. Watch. To those who are spiritually asleep, I sound like a lunatic. Why would I ever come out of such a state of rest and peace? And 
and you're over here yelling in my ear trying to wake me up from my peaceful sleep. Do you see the dynamic at play? Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be. So don't be drunk. Don't be drunk with the wine of her fornication. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith. Now everybody else is taking off their fighting equipment. Lay right down. And the enemy's going to walk into your tent and slit your throat and you never saw it coming. While they're sleeping, he says, let us be sober. And we're, we're getting ready for war. We're getting ready to fight. We're not going to ease. We're going to war. The breastplate of faith and of love. And for the helmet of salvation. And love, if you go back in the previous chapters, previous chapters, he talks about the love of truth. That's what he's talking about in context of Thessalonians, is a love of truth. You better put on faith in a love, love of truth. And for an helmet, the hope, if I can stay awake, if I don't get drunk, sipping the wine of the spirit of false religion, I will be saved. And that hope, Keeps me from falling into deception. Isn't that what God spoke to us this morning? Stand in the holy places. That we be not deceived. Verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. In other words, when God comes to judge the earth and he's going to take all the dead who did not believe in Christ and he's going to cast death and hell into the lake of fire, we're not appointed to God's wrath. But we're appointed to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us. That whether we wake or sleep, and that's talking about literally live or die when he returns. Whether you're living or dying when Christ returns, that we should live together with him when he comes to receive his kingdom upon the earth. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even also as ye do. Now notice, what is he, how are they comforting one another? The, the modern church who's been sipping the wine of false religion comforts one another by saying, don't fight anymore. Don't argue anymore. Don't get involved in this division of doctrine. But Paul says, when, when he's telling us to comfort one another, we're saying, keep fighting. Don't be deceived. Keep studying. Keep praying. Keep fasting. Don't lay down and go to sleep. Fight now more than you ever have. Seek truth. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together. Edify one another even as also you do. And we beseech you, brethren. You better know them which... And are over you in the Lord and admonish them. You better know who's teaching you your version of Christianity. You better know that such a person is sold out to truth. You better know that such a person has a compulsion to preach on divisive issues like doctrine and salvation and Godhead and holiness and righteousness. Because some that are trying to labor among the saints are drunk themselves. And they're teaching the saints to be drunk. And the saints to be at ease. And the saints to be in slumber. You better know. You better know these things. Know them that labor among you. 13. 
and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. If you find somebody that's willing to tell you the truth, don't get mad and walk away from them. Isn't that what everybody does? Finally find somebody who's honest enough to tell you the truth and you're going to get mad and leave and go listen to somebody lie to you. What kind of sense does that make? And people do it all the time. I'd rather hear somebody tell me to take it easy than for somebody to shake me and say, you better wake your carcass up. You better come out of sleep. Esteem them highly in love for their work's sakes and be at peace among your... You ain't going to be at peace in the world. You, if you're looking... Listen, if you ever get to the point to where the, your, the church is not being persecuted, you're in the wrong church. If you're in a church where the politicians can come in and sit on your pews and feel comfortable... Those that are of the beast, the political structure of this world, and they can sit right there and act like everybody else and act like everything's okay, you better run like you have never run in your life. But we'll be at peace among ourselves. The true body of Christ There'll be peace. We'll be. We'll have to stand. Stand up, everyone. We'll have to stand like this, watching one another's back, protecting one another, loving one another, fighting the whole time. But me and him will be bound together with a love and with a peace between us. That's the picture that Paul is drawing of how the end time church should function and operate. Fight. But there'll be peace among the true brothers. Now we exhort you, brethren. Tell them that are unruly to just take it easy. Love each other. You better warn them that are not under rule, that are not under subjection and under the rule and the authority of God's Word. You better warn them. Comfort the feeble-minded, those that are weak-minded. Comfort them. But how do you comfort them? Do you tell them to lay down, take it easy, don't worry about truth, don't worry about doctrine? Or do you, you better wake up, get dressed, put on your war gear, You better get your mind right. You better study the word. That's how you comfort them. Support the weak. Back to back. Fight with them. Fight for them. You see somebody, you see somebody trying to deceive them. You see them slipping off and starting to sip a little bit. Yank the cup out of their hand. Wake them up. Warn them. Support them in in that way. Be patient toward. Don't get weary in having to comfort the feeble-minded and support the weak. I'm going to be honest right here and say that I struggle with that. I want to tell you one time. And you better get it. Because I ain't going to. I'm like the Lord. My spirit will not always strive with man. I'm going to tell you a couple of times. I got to work on that. Be patient toward all men. 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. So the picture that's being painted is the world is persecuting the church, but I'm not supposed to persecute the world back. Why? Because fighting the person is not going to fix the problem. Why am I going to get in a fight with the puppet? If I fight the puppet, I'm just going to get tangled in the strings. 
If I got an issue, I better go to the puppet master. That's who I'm fighting against. Spiritual wickedness in high places. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice. You're on a battlefield and you can't take, a t- you can't take five minutes to slumber or sleep. You've got to keep at it. And then he tells us in, in the face of all of this, which lets me know that joy is not an emotion. Joy is not tied. To my circumstances. Joy is a choice. It's something I choose to do. I choose to rejoice in the face of persecution. Rejoice evermore. Always. Pray. How many churches have prayer meetings anymore? We have people now. And I don't don't mean to speak negative of anybody I simply want to um, I simply want to make us aware of how drunk we are it, it is what it is so we come in here and we open our service with 20 minutes of prayer and people are looking around like what a what a is anybody going to do something who's going to sing who's going to preach think about that though think about that uncomfortable In an atmosphere of prayer. Why am I so uncomfortable in the middle of the saints who are communing with the Almighty God? What about that should I ever be uncomfortable with? That should let us know we have been pre programmed to be entertained by religion. Same thing going on in the movies is going on in pulpits. Most church now, most church that goes on now is nothing more than than entertainment for religious folks. Actors on a stage hooping and screaming and hollering and sweating and then going behind the scenes committing fornication and adultery. Playing music on the platform Sunday morning. Come Saturday night, they're in the club playing music. And then the drunk church leadership are paying them. Here, you just keep playing in the club on Saturday night, but you bring your talents on over and use them for the Lord on Sunday morning. And here, we'll give you a little... You think I'm going to pay a fornicator? To come in the house of God who's not even trying to live right. I don't care how talented you are. What such foolishness goes on in the body of Christ. And yet when we try to get people together for a prayer meeting, they get uncomfortable. Drunk. We've been made drunk by the spirit of false religion. We've been doing church and ain't none of it been pleasing God. Yet the whole time we thought we were. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees in Mark chapter 7 for that very thing. He said, you worship in vain. You're worshiping, but your worship is in vain. Why, Jesus? Because you've laid aside the commandments of God. And you've picked up the traditions of men so now you're trying to worship God but you're doing it man's way and your worship because of this your worship is in my cuckoo for cocoa puffs or is that what he said that's exactly what he said they were religious but they were drunk it's false religion Pray without ceasing. Why does the enemy try to make you so busy that you forget to pray? You can sit at home all day long. I've done it before. Sit at home all day long and just YouTube, Facebook, read books. And do 
nothing. Worthwhile. And then wake up. And I'll be like, I don't think I prayed today. How does that happen? I'm so focused on the natural that I forget the spiritual. In everything, give thanks. So in this atmosphere, we've got to live giving thanks. For this is, Pastor, I don't know what God's will is for me. Number one, just give thanks for wherever you're at. But I ain't got a boyfriend. Give thanks. (laughs) Thank God that you are not married up to some knucklehead. Thank God that you are not divorced with two kids and a single mom. Thank God. But I ain't got a job, Pastor. Thank God that you have not got some job that's going to keep you from praying and worshiping God and keeping your mind right. No matter what situation I'm in, thanks is always the will of God. Always. The will of God in Christ Jesus concerning us. Quench not the spirit. Pray. Get in the Spirit. When you study, the Spirit needs to be in charge of your study. Why do people get off in false doctrine? Because when they study, it's their, their study is not led by the Spirit. If the Scriptures were written, inspired by the Spirit when they were given, guess how the Scriptures have got to be understood? When you try to understand spiritual principles with a carnal mind, you become the enemy of God. Instead of a vessel of God. Isn't that what the carnal mind is? It's the enmity with God. You literally are fighting against God. Talking about spiritual things with the carnal mind. And instead of becoming a vessel for God, you become the enemy of God. Quench not the spirit. Seek for the spirit in all things. Despise not prophesying. I see two extremes. And I hate to... I hate to classify it this way, but it really does seem to be that way. White churches, generally speaking, generally speaking, not all of them, generally speaking, if you got up and started prophesying in the First Baptist Church down the street, the ushers would be on you like white on rice. (laughs) Sit down, sir. Please sit down. Scared to death for somebody to prophesy. Now, the flip coin of that, flip side of that coin, generally speaking, (laughs) black churches will let anybody prophesy anything. Some of the dumbest stuff is said in the name of God and contradicts the scriptures and people just eat it up. God's going to bless you with an $80,000 Mercedes. Woo! I receive it. And all you receive was an $800 a month payment that you can't afford. Is it not true? Yeah, because it's always preferenced by saying, you give me $500, you get your $800 a month payment, to, 500 to me, 800 to Mercedes. Drunk. It doesn't matter. The, the enemy doesn't care which extreme you get this to. Because the only thing those 
the, the first churches that despise prophecy, the only thing they're doing is they're relying on their carnal mind. What is the carnal mind? Death. Enmity with God. So everything they do on a spiritual level is in vain. The flip side of the coin, what's happening? They're listening to false prophets with false prophecy and they're eating it up and being misled to the place where their worship is in vain. The enemy doesn't care which extreme he gets you to. Paul tells the true church, despise not prophesying. But then he tells us in previous chapters, you better be aware of false prophets. That's the balance. Now notice how he closes all this out. Prove. Don't you dare take anything somebody tells you as gospel and you ain't searched the scriptures to prove if it's true or not. Prove everything. Prove everything you've ever been told. Everything. I was told it's okay to celebrate Easter with bunnies and egg hunts and we're we're lifting up Christ. I was told you better prove it. You better prove it in the scriptures. I was told it was okay. To remarry after a divorce. You better prove it. Because that ain't what Jesus said. And that ain't what Paul said. They're as plain as day. Concerning such issues. Whosoever putteth away his wife. And marry another. If while a man put away his wife, or or Romans 7, if a woman is put away from her husband and she marries another man, she shall be called an adulteress. So the law says she's married. God says she's an adulteress. That's what I'm telling you with this. We have been lulled to sleep, sipping the Kool-Aid of false prophets and false teachers teaching things to appease our flesh which stand in opposition to the perfect will of God. And we're doing it all in the name of God. Prove everything you have ever been told. What I've told you this morning, guess what you should do with it? Prove it. Get in the scriptures. Read Deuteronomy 12. Read Jeremiah 10. Read Romans 7. Read Revelation 17, 18. Read these and prove all things. And then once you've proved everything, even the most basic things that you just knew were right, prove it too. And once you've proved all things, hold fast. What do you do with that which is not good? You better cast it out like it's The plague. Because that's exactly what it is. It's false doctrine by the spirit of false religion. Doctrines of devils, seducing spirits is what Paul called them in in, in the epistle to Timothy. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that try to wiggle their way into the church. But if you're proving all things and you're only holding fast to that which is good and you're casting away, forsaking all other, that's how you stay awake. That's how you keep from being intoxicated with the spirit of false religion. Is that it? Abstain. If it even looks like it's evil, stay away from it. But isn't that the opposite mentality of what most Christians have today? They want to get as close to to evil as they can. And the mentality of the apostles was the opposite. If you even think it might be evil, stay away from it. Well, you don't understand, Pastor. See, I'm more mature now. I'm, I'm mature enough 
to be able to be around this evil. You realize God told Job a very telling statement in, in, in the book of Job. He said, God putteth no trust in his saints. Did you know God don't trust you? You know why God doesn't trust you? Your flesh. He knows your default operating system is the carnal mind. And if you are left to yourself to start trying to decide, you will fall. You will be deceived. You'll give in to your flesh. So then he imparts to us the spiritual mind. The spiritual mind to understand the spiritual scriptures. And the scriptures tell us how to live and what to flee from and what not to do. But what happens if you're ignorant of the scriptures? You don't stand a chance. That's why we prove all things. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? The whole chapter has been talking about war and fighting against false doctrine and lies. But then he's the God of peace. Isn't that amazing? In, in, in Ephesians where he talks about the whole armor of God. He said your feet shall be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. But he's telling you to get dressed for battle. So you're going to be in the midst of fighting. And yet you're going to be covered with peace. Chaos will be all around you. But you're covered with the God of peace. And, and the very God of peace. What's he trying to do? Sanctify, cleanse you, purge you. How? All of you. He doesn't just want your Sunday morning sanctified. He wants your Monday mornings when the boss is cussing you out on the job. He wants you sanctified. Friday night. Saturday night. Sanctified. Holy. And I pray, God, your whole spirit, soul, and body. Anybody remember that? Three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. All of that plays so much into this, but I, don't, I can't get into it now. Be preserved. I, God's saying, I want to get you to the place where they can't even accuse you of wrongdoing. They can't even blame you. Stephen stood, preached against the Jews. They could... They hated what he was saying, but they could not prove him wrong. That's blameless. They hated him, they hated his message, but they couldn't put a finger on him. Got so mad with him, they started biting him. Physically biting him. Until, be blameless how long? Jesus Christ is going to return. That's it. No, 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 no. Faithful is he. Who also will, will do it. Pray for the apostles. Pray for the ministers who are teaching and preaching these things. You better pray for them. Great. Greet all the brethren with them. Skip that one. We don't If I ever get to the place, Elder Pierce, where I kiss you, please consider that a holy kiss. Holy kiss. Not any unholy kissing and, and, and just the brothers. Don't be kissing any sisters with a holy kisses. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with you, amen. That's it, right? Would you stand with me right now? Let's pray. Lift your hands and let's lift our voices and let's pray to God. Thanking Him for our, His Word and committing ourselves to refuse to go into slumber and sleep, but to fight the good fight of faith. Seeking for all truth. Proving all things. That we not be intoxicated by the spirit of false religion, which is Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, 
that we be not seduced by seducing spirits and doctrines of devils that come to corrupt the church, but that we be pure and holy, blameless and righteous until the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, that we may reign with Him according to Your perfect will. Almighty God, do we pray all of these things. Purge us, sanctify us wholly, completely and totally, O oh God. That is our sincere prayer today. Sanctify us by your word, for your word is truth. Sanctify us by your word today. That we not sleep and we not slumber. For we are not children of the darkness. But we are children of the light. And we cannot sleep as others do. So we recommit ourselves to pray. And to study. And to, and to get into the word. Oh God. To see if these things be true. That we may be noble. As those disciples were noble father. We pray all of this in sincerity. Lead us and guide us by your spirit of truth. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, do we pray all of these things. And you can keep us from falling. Thank God for such word of encouragement. <laughs> Hallelujah. You guys can remain standing. I just want to give one passage of scriptures here. Give me Luke 12, starting from verse 35. Just four verses. I won't keep you long because it's, this God has been real good to us for everything that we have done. If you want to see me seated, that's fine. Hallelujah. But I think it's really good that we've gotten so much warnings and so much consolation from the word of God that we may know truly to be ready, to be on the watch. Get ourselves together and get our minds, heart and right in the place that we can understand what we in, the time we're living in, the seasons that we're in and the spirit that's behind it, that we may be, although we in this world, but we are not off it. And if we're not off it, we cannot operate. So we have to be more alert. I love it. The idea of a soldier that get it not himself entangled with the affairs of this life. I love the fact that when he talks about all these things that God to bring forth today, I think about Nehemiah. Again, we think about Nehemiah. While they're building the wall, they have their knives out. They're warring at the same time. They're building the wall. And all these things are played out. In the days of old, even now, he's telling us to gird ourselves up. Uh, Luke 12, starting from verse uh, 35. It says, let your loins, all this that we have received, let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. We have to allow that light of the gospel, that Holy Ghost, that fire that's in us, the passion and desire to continue burn to separate us from this world. Next verse. And you yourselves, like unto men, natural men of this world, they wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding, that when he what he went that when he cometh and knocketh that may open unto him immediately so all this is giving us a preparation that while we are doing these things consistently we don't know when the hour the time when our lord jesus will come but when he come that I pray that he may find faith on the earth. That we find ourselves working. Because that which he gives unto us, we have to redeem on that day of, on that day of redemption. On that day, 
That which is given, he's looking for production. Remember the talents. He gave one, five, one, two, one, one. He came back. He went away. That's the kingdom of God. He came back. He said, the one that had five, he said, you gave me five. I bring you five more. He said, well done. Enter. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been what? Faithful over what? A few things. I'll now make you ruler over many. The same result was given to the one with two. But he had a problem with the one that he gave one. It is not how much you have been given. It's that which was given to you. What did you do with, the, with that? Did you produce the fruit of righteousness? That your hearts may burn in truth. In the midst of persecution. That so those that are off will wait like a bride adorned waiting for her husband to come. Don't know when, but I'm ready. Blessed are those servants. Hallelujah. Whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. That's the, that's right there. Watching. We talk about it. Watching. Pray and watch. Verily I say unto you, he shall Gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. Next verse. And if he shall come in the, see, it doesn't matter which watch. He's just coming. Doesn't matter. It didn't say. He said, I come as a thief in the night. He said, he didn't say. He says, first, first he said, watch. Notice. He said, and, and, and if he shall come in the second watch or come in the third watch to find them so, blessed are those servants. He doesn't care what time. All he cares, are you even going to be ready walking in the holiness, purging ourselves continuously? 39. And this know that if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Last verses, verse 40. So. B. It's a command. Ready also for. In the hour when. We think not. We just wanted to meditate as we see these things. Uh, they are the, the, the things, the tides are turning. We see that we burn our hearts with the hope that is given to us through Christ Jesus. That we be not of the church that commercializes itself from this world. Or be drunk under that abomination of false doctrine. But we be of the church that will array in white linen because of her righteousness, according to Revelations 19. That's the bride. That's the church we want to be in. Because so, so, so shall it be even unto now. A separation even the more will come. And only those that is of the light and of the day will make it. Meditate on these things.